TWA Flight 800. On July 17, 1996, Transworld Airlines Flight 800, a Boeing 747, took off from New York's JFK Airport on a journey to Paris and Rome. But just 12 minutes later, as it climbed through the night sky, a massive explosion tore the plane apart. All 230 people on board were killed. The fireball was so large and bright that dozens of witnesses on the ground, some as far as 10 miles away, saw it. Their accounts of a streak of light before the explosion immediately fueled speculation of a terrorist attack, possibly a missile strike. The FBI launched a parallel criminal investigation alongside the National Transportation Safety Board, creating a tense, at times contentious atmosphere as the two agencies worked side by side. The investigation became the most extensive in U.S. history with more than 95% of the wreckage painstakingly recovered from the ocean floor. The NTSB meticulously reconstructed the plane in a hangar like a giant tragic jigsaw puzzle. They discovered that the initial explosion happened inside the aircraft's center fuel tank. The flammable fuel vapor inside had ignited, likely from a short circuit. The plane's air conditioning units ran directly underneath the tank, heating the fuel to dangerous temperatures. Although traces of explosive residue were found, the NTSB concluded they were likely a result of contamination from the recovery efforts, which involved military personnel and ships. The streak of light witnesses saw was likely the aircraft itself, with its front section shearing off and continuing to climb for a few seconds before the rest of the plane fell into the sea. The final report led to new safety regulations for all aircraft, aiming to prevent a similar fuel tank explosion from ever happening again. U.S. Air Flight 427 on September 8, 1994, U.S. Air Flight 427, a Boeing 737 carrying 132 people, was on its final approach to Pittsburgh when something went terribly wrong. The plane was flying at about 6,000 feet, following another jet, when it suddenly encountered wake turbulence. The pilots, Captain Peter Germano and First Officer Charles Emmett III, immediately found themselves in a losing battle for control. The jet lurched violently, rolling sharply to the left. The cockpit voice recorder captured the pilots' final desperate moments, with one shouting, What the hell is this? And the other one exclaiming, Oh shit! Just before the final scream and impact. The plane plunged to the ground at 300 miles per hour, hitting the earth at an 80-degree nose-down angle just 28 seconds after the initial disturbance. The crash site in Hopewell Township, Pennsylvania, was a scene of such devastation that investigators had to wear biohazard suits. The investigation became the second longest in NTSB history, spanning more than four years. The central mystery was the plane's rudder. Did a pilot error cause that fatal roll, or was it a mechanical failure? A key piece of evidence was that the pilots, in their struggle to correct the roll, had pulled back on the control yoke, a natural but catastrophic mistake. This action caused the plane to stall, making it impossible for them to regain control. The NTSB ultimately found a design flaw in the 737's rudder system, concluding that a malfunction caused the rudder to move in the opposite direction of the pilot's command. This finding also explained the previously unsolved crash of United Airlines Flight 585. The resolution of this mystery led to a mandatory redesign of the 737's rudder system across the globe, a legacy of the 132 lives lost that day. United Airlines Flight 585 On March 3, 1991, United Airlines Flight 585 was just minutes from landing in Colorado Springs when something went catastrophically wrong. The Boeing 737, carrying 20 passengers and 5 crew members, was lined up for runway 35. Winds were gusty but manageable, and Captain Harold Green, a seasoned pilot with over 9,000 hours of experience, had everything under control. First Officer Patricia Eidson, highly regarded for her skills, was monitoring the approach. Then, without warning, the aircraft's rudder snapped violently to one side. The jet rolled sharply, pitch nose down, and in a matter of seconds plummeted over 240 miles per hour, striking the ground at an 80-degree angle. The impact carved a crater 39 feet long, 24 feet wide, and 15 feet deep, killing everyone instantly. What made this tragedy even more disturbing was that it wasn't the first sign of trouble. Just days before, the same aircraft had experienced unexplained rudder movements mid-flight but returned safely. Initially, investigators were baffled. The flight data recorder was intact, but it didn't track rudder position, and the cockpit voice tape was distorted. The National Transportation Safety Board could only say the cause was undetermined. Then, in 1994, U.S. Air Flight 427 crashed under almost identical circumstances. Another near disaster followed in 1996 with Eastwind Airlines Flight 517. The pattern was impossible to ignore. Years of reopened investigations finally revealed the culprit a defect in the rudder power control unit that could jam, forcing the rudder to move in the opposite direction from the pilot's commands. 
It was a flaw capable of turning a stable flight into an unrecoverable dive in seconds. Today, 25 trees stand in Whitefield Park as a living memorial to the victims. The crash, once a mystery, became a landmark case in aviation safety, a reminder that a single hidden defect can destroy even the most carefully flown flight. United Airlines Flight 553 On December 8, 1972, a United Airlines Boeing 737 Flight 553 was making its final approach to Chicago Midway International Airport. The flight had originated in Washington, D.C., and was en route to Omaha. The crew, led by Captain Wendell Whitehouse, a veteran pilot with 18,000 flight hours, was navigating in overcast conditions. The airport was only visible below 600 feet, which meant a precision landing was required. When the plane reached a crucial waypoint, it was still far too high, over 1,100 feet above where it should have been. In an attempt to correct this, the crew extended the spoilers and initiated a rapid descent. The descent was incredibly steep, more than 1,500 feet per minute. After leveling off at an altitude of just 429 feet, the crew made a series of critical errors. They failed to retract the spoilers, which greatly increased the drag on the aircraft, then pulled back on the flaps at the same time. The airspeed dropped rapidly, and the stick shaker, a device that warns of an impending stall, activated. The aircraft crashed into a residential neighborhood just southeast of the runway, destroying five houses. The crash killed 43 of the 61 people on board, along with two people on the ground. Among the casualties were Illinois' Congressman George Collins and Dorothy Hunt, the wife of Watergate conspirator E. Howard Hunt. The presence of Hunt, who was carrying $10,000 in cash, led to a whirlwind of conspiracy theories alleging that the plane had been sabotaged by government agencies. The FBI arrived at the scene a mere 45 minutes after the crash, before the NTSB, a fact that only fueled the rumors. Ultimately, investigators concluded that the crash was the result of pilot error. Air Florida Flight 90 January 13, 1982, Washington, D.C. was gripped by a brutal winter storm. Snow blanketed the city, freezing everything it touched. Yet Air Florida Flight 90 was still cleared for takeoff. The Boeing 737 sat on the icy tarmac for nearly an hour, its pilots battling more than just bad weather. The captain had a history of failed check rides, and his first officer, a former Air Force pilot, was new to flying in conditions like this. What happened next turned a routine flight into one of aviation's most haunting tragedies. When a ground tug couldn't push the plane back, the crew tried something reckless. They fired the engines in reverse thrust, a move the manufacturer explicitly warned against. It packed the snow tight around the aircraft. Instead of returning for a second de-icing, they gambled with time, believing a quick departure would keep them on schedule. Then came an even stranger decision. They lined up behind another jet, thinking its exhaust would melt the ice on their wings. It didn't. The slush froze harder, setting the stage for disaster. As the engines roared and the plane thundered down the runway, the first officer's voice carried unease. The instruments weren't showing enough power, but the captain pressed on. The 737 struggled for lift, eating up half a mile more runway than usual. It barely clawed 352 feet in the air before stalling, crashing into the 14th Street Bridge, smashing into six cars and a truck before plunging into the frozen Potomac River. 78 lives were lost that day. Only five survived, clinging to wreckage in the icy water. One man, Arlen D. Williams Jr., became the face of courage. As rescuers lowered lifelines, he handed them to others again and again, refusing his own chance to live. By the time help reached him, he was gone. A silent hero who put four strangers before himself. Pan Am Flight 759 A tragic tale of weather's fury and a plane's fatal last moments unfolded on July 9, 1982 in Kenner, Louisiana. Pan Am Flight 759 a Boeing 727 had just lifted off from New Orleans International Airport, but its ascent was to be heartbreakingly brief. The crew was experienced. The captain and first officer had thousands of hours between them, and the flight engineer was a true veteran with nearly 20,000 hours in the cockpit. But what they couldn't see, and what the technology of the time was ill-equipped to detect, was a monster lurking in the humid summer air. A microburst. This powerful localized downdraft of air was part of a thunderstorm system, and it slammed into the plane just after it left the runway. In an instant, the aircraft lost vital lift and began to sink, despite the pilots' efforts. The cockpit voice recorder captured a frantic, desperate final exchange as the captain exclaimed, Come on back, you're sinking, Don. Come on back. The plane, caught in this invisible hand of nature, was helpless. It clipped a line of trees, then tore through a quiet suburban neighborhood, destroying homes and leaving a path of destruction. The impact was catastrophic, killing all 145 people on board and eight more on the ground. 
In the aftermath, a miracle was discovered amid the wreckage and fire. A 16-month-old baby girl found in her crib with only minor burns. Her survival was a stark counterpoint to the widespread devastation. The investigation that followed this horrific event and a similar crash three years later would change aviation forever. It exposed a critical blind spot in weather forecasting and airport safety, directly leading to the development and installation of sophisticated wind shear detection systems on both the ground and an aircraft, a grim but vital legacy born from the tragedy of Flight 759. U.S. Air Flight 1493 on February 1, 1991, Los Angeles International Airport became the stage for one of the deadliest runway collisions in U.S. aviation history. U.S. Air Flight 1493, a Boeing 737 carrying 89 people, was cleared to land on runway 24L. At the same time, Sky West Flight 5569, a small Fairchild Metro liner with 12 aboard, had been instructed to taxi into position for takeoff on the very same runway. The local air traffic controller, distracted by communication issues with another aircraft and hampered by a broken ground radar, mistakenly believed the runway was clear. Moments later, the 737 touched down, and its crew spotted the smaller plane only as the nose lowered to the asphalt. Brakes were slammed, but it was too late. The 737 crushed the metro liner beneath it, skidded off the runway, and slammed into an abandoned airport fire station. The wreck erupted in flames. All 12 aboard the metro liner died instantly. On the 737, 23 people were killed, many from smoke inhalation as fire consumed the forward cabin. Survivors faced chaos, blocked exits, passengers unable to open overwing doors, and even scuffles at escape points. Billionaire David Koch was among those who escaped, later describing how close he came to death. Investigators found a chain of failures, poor runway use procedures, a blind spot in the tower's view, the lack of external lights on idle aircraft, and a controller with known performance issues. The FAA had failed to address these risks, and LAX's reliance on mixed-use runways for both takeoffs and landings had set the stage for disaster. The tragedy led to sweeping changes, runway segregation for landings and departures, improved tower visibility, and stricter evacuation material standards. Yet, for those trapped in that inferno, the difference between life and death came down to seconds, blocked doors, and the suffocating smoke filling the cabin. Delta Airlines Flight 1141 on August 31, 1988, Delta Airlines Flight 1141 lined up on Dallas-Fort Worth's runway 18L bound for Salt Lake City. The Boeing 727 lifted off, but within seconds, it was in trouble. The jet rolled violently, its tail scraped the runway, and the right wing clipped an antenna, igniting a fire that began tearing the aircraft apart midair. Just 22 seconds after liftoff, the plane slammed back to the ground, skidding more than half a mile before stopping in flames. 14 people were dead most from smoke inhalation, and 76 were injured. Investigators quickly zeroed in on a shocking oversight. The flaps and slats, essential for generating lift at takeoff, had never been extended. The cockpit voice recorder revealed why. Instead of focusing on their checklist, the crew chatted about dating habits, drink recipes, and even joked about what they'd say if the plane crashed. That juicy tidbit line would come back to haunt them when the tapes went public prompting such outrage from pilots that a federal law was later passed to ban the release of actual cockpit audio. The takeoff warning system, which should have sounded an alert, was dead silent. A faulty switch, never detected during maintenance, had rendered it useless. The FAA later found dozens of similar issues across the 727 fleet. But this wasn't just about a broken system. It was about culture. Delta's lax enforcement of cockpit discipline and the FAA's failure to push harder for fixes were called out as major contributing factors. The probable cause was ruled as crew error and system failure, but one safety board member went further, placing direct blame on Delta management and the FAA. The crash wasn't just a lesson in mechanical reliability. It was a damning example of how distraction, poor leadership, and overlooked safety checks can combine into catastrophe in less than half a minute. Aloha Airlines Flight 243 on April 28, 1988, Aloha Airlines Flight 243 left Hilo bound for Honolulu with 90 passengers and 5 crew. The Boeing 737 named Queen Liliuokalani had already done three short island hops that day without incident. At 24,000 feet, just 26 miles from Maui, a deafening whoosh shattered the calm. A massive section of the fuselage roof, about 18 feet long, ripped away, exposing passengers to the open sky. The cockpit door blew off. Insulation floated in the air, and the first-class ceiling was simply gone. Chief Flight Attendant Clarabelle C.B. Lansing, a beloved 37-year veteran, was standing near row 5 when the decompression struck. She was instantly swept out of the aircraft. 
her body was never recovered. 65 people were injured, eight seriously, but every other passenger survived. First Officer Madeline Mimi Tompkins had been flying when the rupture occurred. Captain Robert Schornsteimer took over, diving to a safer altitude. With a failing left engine and uncertainty over the nose gear, the crew still managed to land on Maui just 13 minutes after the rupture. The island had no mass casualty plan. Only two ambulances existed, so tour vans were converted into emergency shuttles. Former paramedics among the drivers set up triage right on the runway. Investigators found metal fatigue and corrosion had eaten away at the 19-year-old jet's skin, worsened by its constant exposure to salty, humid air and its extreme flight cycle count, second highest of any 737 in the world. Maintenance inspections, often done at night, failed to detect the hidden cracks. Boeing's early fuselage bonding design and the FAA's lack of mandatory inspections for these lap joints sealed the jet's fate. Flight 243's survival was called a miracle. But the scars, physical, emotional, and regulatory, reshaped aviation safety forever. CB Lansing's name now lives on in a memorial garden at Honolulu International Airport.